Uh, to understand the thread of this, please uh, see the previous two videos. And apparently this is going to run to four videos because this is more than ten minutes worth here. I've already read it through once and it's too long. Uh, the second argument, that the imperfection of nature reveals evolution, strikes many people as ironic, for they feel that evolution should be most Ill elegantly displayed in the nearly perfect adaptation expressed by some organisms, the camber of a gull's wing, or butterflies that cannot be seen in ground litter because they mimic leaves so precisely. But perfection could be imposed by a wise creator, or evolved by natural selection. Perfection covers the tracks of past history, and past history, the evidence of descent, is the mark of evolution. Evolution lies exposed on the imperfections in the imperfections that record a history of descent. Why should a rat run, a bat fly, a porpoise swim, and I type this essay with structures built of the same bones unless we are all, uh, all inherited them from a common ancestor? An engineer, starting from scratch, could design better limbs in each case. Why should all the large native mammals of Australia be marsup marsupials unless they descended from a common ancestor isolated on this island continent? Marsupials are not better or ideally suited for Australia. Many have been wiped out by placental mammals imported by man from other continents. This principle of imperfection extends to all historical sciences. When we recognize the etymology of September, October, November, and December, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, we know that the year once started in March, or that two additional months must have been added to an original calendar of 10 months. The third argument is more direct. Transitions are often found in the fossil record. Preserved transitions are not common, and should not be according to our understanding of evolution. See the next section. Now he's referring to the next section in this book, but we're not going there. But they, are not in, but they are not entirely wanting, as creationists often claim. The lower jaw of reptiles contains several bones, that of mammals only one. The non-mammalian jaw bones are reduced step by step in mammalian ancestors until they become tiny nubbins located at the back of the jaw. The hammer and anvil bones of the mammalian ear are descendants of these nubbins. How could such a transition be accomplished? The creationists ask. Surely a bone is either entirely in the jaw or in the ear. Yet paleontologists have discovered two transitional lineages of therapsids, the so-called mammal-like reptiles, with a double jaw joint, one composed of the old quadrate and articular bones, soon to become the hammer and anvil, the other of the squamosal and dentary bones, as in modern mammals. For that matter, what better transitional form could we expect to find than the oldest human, Australopithecus uh, aff afarensis, with its ape-like palate, its human upright stance, and a cranial capacity larger than any apes, of the same body size, but a full thousand cubic centimeters below ours. If God made each of the half-dozen human species discovered in ancient rocks, why did he create an unbroken temporal sequence of progressively more modern features? Increasing cranial capacity, reduced face and teeth, larger body size. Did he create to mimic evolution and test our faith thereby? Faced with these facts of evolution and the philosophical bankruptcy of their own position, creationists rely upon distortion and innuendo to buttress their rhetorical claim. If I sound sharp or bitter, indeed I am, for I have become a major target of these practices. I count myself among the evolutionists who argue for a jerky or episodic rather than a smoothly gradual pace of change. In 1972, my colleagues Niles Eldridge and I, my colleague Niles Eldridge and I, <clears throat> developed the theory of punctuated equilibrium. We argued that two outstanding facts of the fossil record, geologically sudden origin of new species and failure to change thereafter, stasis, reflect the predictions of evolutionary theory, not the imperfections of the fossil record. In most theories, 
Small, isolated populations are the source of new species, and the process of speciation takes thousands or tens of thousands of years. This amount of time, so long when measured against our lives, is a geological microsecond. It represents much less than 1% of the average lifespan for a fossil inverte invertebrate species, more than 10 million years. Large, widespread, and well-established species, on the other hand, are not expected to change very much. We believe that the inertia of large populations explains the stasis of most fossil species over millions of years. Now, I'm going to cut this here and uh, go on to number four because um, this will be a short one and then number four uh, about probably equal in length. And we're getting close to the end, but I don't want to run out and I want to make a few comments at the end here. So this will be um, the end of segment three.